planning your personal path out of the nation's economic and financial meltdown next on Evening Exchange. Hi, I'm Kojo Namdi. What it comes down to, even while we try to figure out what caused it all, even as we try to understand the big picture and we ask, what's wrong with the economy overall? How do we reform the massive health care system? How do we make sure hardworking Americans don't default on their mortgages? Even as we look at these things, we're always keeping one eye on the home front. How is this affecting my financial situation? In this edition of our series, Facing the Mortgage Crisis, we look at what each of us can be doing to make sure our own financial situation is secure. How can we correct our missteps and how can we build a solid financial foundation for ourselves and for our families? Joining us now is Jennifer Matthews, President and CEO of Creating Financial Literacy, LLC. Antoine Harris is Vice President and Financial Consultant for Charles Schwab & Company. And Lanta Evans Mott is financial advisor and director of outreach for the Literary Institute for Financial Enrichment. Allow me to start with you, Jennifer. Why is financial literary literacy so important at this time? It's critically important because a lot of people don't have a foundation of financial literacy. It's contributed to the economic crisis and then we have generations behind that the parents can't teach their children how to manage money. So right now it needs to be a household family affair. When you say a household family affair, does that mean the young ones ought to be involved in financial literacy also? Oh, absolutely. And people often say to me, well, how young is too young to start teaching my children about money? And my standard answer is as soon as your child says, give me, it's time to teach. Let me make this a little more personal. How has the nation's financial meltdown affected your personal finances? Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Um, have you suffered any? Yes. Um, anyone who has money invested in the stock market, um, real estate holdings. Um, so it's not only my 401k. No. no. Okay, thank no. you. Thank so you. investment professionals are not. Um, adverse or, or exempt from um, being impacted by the financial crisis as well. Nevertheless, if an individual was so diversified enough before the financial meltdown, is it likely that that individual came off better than somebody who had all their eggs in one basket, so to speak? Generally speaking, yes, that would be the case. Um, the 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 economics of 2008 were a little bit different in that stocks and bonds and the traditional asset allocation diversification didn't protect people the way it had traditionally done. I mean, typically if you had some money in stocks, some bonds, some cash, some in alternative investments like hedge funds, something would have been up while something else was down. In 2008, almost everything was down. And almost everything was down substantially because we end up having um, not only the mortgage crisis, but a liquidity crisis. And we were close to a global financial meltdown. So 2008 really was kind of an extraordinary year in that even people who did the right thing end up suffering a lot more than normal. Antoine, uh, pursuing this financial literacy tip for a while here, I want to talk about Bernard Madoff, for instance, because I think, and most people think, we know a Ponzi scheme when we see one. If I am going to invest my money someplace and somebody promises me, a, an annual 100% return on my investment or even an annual 50% return on my investment, I'm generally going to say, there's something up here. However, if this person explains a very complica complicated formulation that I may not understand and says, that's how you're going to be getting a 100% annual return on your investment, should I still nevertheless be suspicious? Absolutely. If, um and this applies to anything in life. If it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, there's no environment where someone's going to make money every year. And um, that's an impossibility. So if he's explaining some type of esoteric financial scheme or plan or some type of proprietary system that he or she follows, um, I would turn and run the other way. If you have a, a healthy 
portfolio over the long run, you are going to have some years where you, you have a loss. And that's the natural progression of, of markets. But over the longer period of time, you should end up in, in positive territory. What you also need to make sure of is where your assets are being domiciled. Um, with the Madoff scheme, he actually had control of the asset, and he, so he custodied the asset with his firm, and he was providing advice on the portfolios. What you want to look for is a, a, a separation between where these assets were being held and the person that's actually providing the advice on the asset. So you want uh, the assets to be held with um, a national firm that has a strong reputation that you can point to and say, well, I know this firm. I believe in this actual firm that I'm dealing with, and then I also trust the advisor that's providing the advice. Let's talk about the investment climate in which we now find ourselves. When I was growing up, you put your money in the bank, you got a job, the job offered a pension plan. At the end of, oh, 40 years working for that company, you retired and you got a fixed pension for the rest of your life. That's not the situation it is for most of us who are working anymore. We have been introduced to 401ks as a part of our retirement planning, which thrusts us into the world of understanding investment. Can you compare how for the average family of four making an income of, oh, 70000 or $80,000 a year, how the world has changed during the past 20 years or so? Well, it's, it's, I'm going to defer the financial part of that question to the financial planners. But just in general, we're in a quote unquote microwave society where we want things now. There's no more delayed gratification, deferred gratification, where we let money sit, rest, and grow. We have to have it now. For everything else, there's plastic. We're, the media and society in general has grown us into want it now at any cost, it doesn't matter. and then from there, there's not a lot of money to be put into the accounts because we're spending so much, and then we don't always leave the money in the accounts long enough. To what extent does our lack, has our lack of financial literacy contributed completely outside of the mortgage crisis to the situation so many people find themselves in with credit card debt? What is it that so many of us did not seem to understand about getting so many credit cards in the mail and being able to use them that we now, in the wake of the meltdown, should understand. Well, when you have that glitzy, glamoury item in front of you that you just <coughs> have told yourself you have to have, you don't think about the payment that's coming later. And you may not realize the accumulated total on multiple cards. And then you come outside and you have a flat tire or your brakes go and then there's something that you need and there's no room on a card, so you go get another one, or you add it on to the card. And it's just a cycle of buying and buying and buying, and then when the bills come, it's, oh my goodness, because there was no proper planning. But our consciousness has been raised about this, but your consciousness was obviously raised about this long before the financial meltdown. In some ways, in terms of the, of the credit problems we're having, is this something you could see coming? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. And how do you counsel people now? Um, on the issue of financial literacy? People are so afraid or not willing to have a budget. So we use the word spending plan, and it's a plan to spend. And I was just speaking with someone last night. You plan your vacation for months in advance, but most people don't plan how they spend that paycheck that direct deposits into their account every other week. And you have to begin at the beginning and you have to make a plan to spend that money so that it lasts. It needs to last beyond the two weeks till you get the next check. For a lot of people it doesn't last beyond the weekend. We listen to people now debating economic stimulus packages. We listen to people debating the issue of how best to expand credit in the economy, whether we should put the money on Wall Street and investment banks, or whether we should somehow be able to filter the money to Main Street. And even as we're trying to follow that discussion, we're trying to say, what does all of this mean for me? What are the lessons in all of this for me? What should the average family take away from what we have seen happening in the country during the course of the past year, starting with you? I, I think the big thing is um, some some basic information. To some extent, um, before when when credit was more difficult, you had some assurance when you went to the bank that they were not going to give you a loan that you couldn't repay because they were on the hook for it. 
Well, as mortgages got more sophisticated and they passed the risk to someone else, they didn't really care whether you paid or not because it was going to be somebody else's problem. But that still did not relieve us of the responsibility to figure out what we really can afford. And that's the basic piece that it comes down to, figuring out what your budget allows you to afford. Given whatever income you have coming into the house, there's a formula, some kind of range, to give you an estimate of how much you should be spending on housing. No more than 25 to 30 percent of your gross income should be spent on housing. 10 to 15 percent on transportation costs. Those are the two biggest items. If you mess up on those, there's not a hot, whole lot left, and that's where a lot of people are. They're spending 40, 50, 60 percent on housing because they bought really expensive homes and they're driving fancy cars that may take 20 or 30 percent. If that's 70 or 80 percent of your budget, there's not much left over to put in the retirement plan, to spend on a college education fund for your children, to set aside for the family vacation that you really want to plan, to help take care of the parents or grandparents who might need assistance. There's just not enough left over. So getting back to the basic of spending less than what you earn, because if you don't do that, there's nothing to save. But how do we navigate this fairly complicated environment? You buy a new home and you get ready on the day to go sign on the dotted line and when you get there, there are 250 different <coughs> documents that you have to sign off to and you're trying to figure out, okay, I know this will take four or five hours, but I don't know if I really understand all of this. It's the same in a way if you're sitting down to work out a financial plan for your family. Where should one start? Well, there are a number of places uh, where you can start to have some basic education around um, basic financial matters. And I think that's essential for anyone trying to, to navigate this, the modern economy that we're dealing with. Whether you're buying a home, planning for retirement, planning to educate your children, there's some basic things that you need to understand. A tremendous number of resources are available online. Uh, I would start there, and before you even meet with a professional, you should have a reasonable level of proficiency with some of the basic terminology, some of the basic tenants around those areas. Um, it's not the time to try to learn about a mortgage when you're sitting at the table <laughs> about to sign the closing document. Been there, done that. Exactly. So <laughs> now there are some, some nonprofit entities, and Olanta is, is active with, with one that she works with, um, professionals like Jennifer and her company, where you can go and start to really educate yourself via seminars, um, booklets, things of that manner. I happen to volunteer for one, uh, the Capital Area Asset Builders, uh, CAAB.org, where they have free seminars for clients. Um, many things that you can do to help educate yourself before you actually go through and buy probably the largest thing you're ever going to buy in your life, which is your home, or embark upon saving for retirement, where if you get that wrong, you don't have any financial aid or anyone that's going to bail you out for retirement. So those are critical things that you really need to take some time and spend a little time to educate yourself on. You know, one of the things we're hearing about in the health care debate is that a lot of people between the ages of 20 and 40 who are very healthy don't think that they actually need health insurance at all because you remember when you were young, you'll never die, you'll be strong, you'll be healthy forever. A lot of young people think the same way about retirement. What do you advise people about when they should start planning for their retirement? Well, fortunately, I was taught in my early 20s to put money away, and every time you get a pay increase at work, quote unquote, don't accept it. Estimate that amount and add that amount to your retirement plan because you were living without it anyway. And as I say, I was dumb enough in my 20s to take that advice. And when I got laid off in my 30s, I was amazed that my net paycheck was only a hundred dollars difference from my unemployment check. That's when the realization came how much money I had been saving. And I was so glad that I had followed that advice because I was living without the money anyway. And you need to plan, start planning and saving for retirement for a home with your first job. As a matter of fact, parents need to take more time teaching their, especially their teenagers who may have an allowance or a part-time job about savings. As I say, you would rather your child be broke and run out of money in the comforts of your home than be 28 outside the house and run out of money and be broke. So let your child start managing money at the age of 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 before they go to college so that they've had that experience. And if they run out of money, let them figure it out. Again, you're there to catch them because when they're 28, 30, 40, you can't catch them. Well, answer me this question. If you started saving towards retirement, if you took that advice as a young person in your early 20s, 
when was your irresponsible period? When did you, <laughs> when, when did you like have a good time and not worry about it? Oh, trust me. Don't you I hate people a, who start I had a great time. so early? <laughs> oh, my, my 20s were roaring. I had a great time. <laughs> when people come to you now, what are your observations in terms of when people tend to come to you concerned about investing for their retirement? Uh, generally, it's in their late 40s, early 50s, um, when most people um, start to kind of focus in Is that on when it. we start to begin to feel our mortality, so to speak? I think it's probably that as well as um, a lot of people are, are considered part of the sandwich generation now. So they're feeling the pressure from having to raise children, fund them through college, but also have some responsibility for the care of their parents. So they're starting to feel that squeeze in their realizing that their parents were not appropriately prepared for retirement so they're having to fill some of that gap so they're feeling more pressure to want to prepare for retirement but they're squeezed financially because they're stretched at both ends with responsibility. Yeah, this is kind of the trial and error generation where you have um, middle-aged people that have the responsibility for their parents a lot longer than they had historically. Mm -hmm. I mean, typically people would work till they're 65, then their life expectancy was 70, so they'd have five years of retirement. Well, now, where life expectancy is in the mid 80s, you have responsibility for parents potentially, you have um, these education costs that were growing at 6% per annum. So they're trying to educate their children, prepare for their own retirement, and potentially take care of parents. We haven't had a situation like this in our history. So it's imperative at this point that you do um, some sort of financial planning and make some smart decisions around your money. I'm glad you said we haven't had a situation like this in our history. So in a lot of respects, when somebody comes to you in their mid to late 40s and says, I am now preparing for retirement, I am now concerned for retirement, is it your job to institute the reality check? Absolutely, absolutely. You say, well, let's talk about, let's do some basic planning. Let's put a stake in the ground. Let's do a net worth statement. Let's figure out what your cash flow is. Let's, let's talk about a potential budget. When you start to present that reality and you run some reasonable, reasonable proje projections for clients, um, you start to see that a lot of times the husband's expectation may be a little different than the wife's expectation. To, together, that they may not have realistic expectations. Um, and that kind of really puts the light on everything so that people start to say, hey, I really need to start to be a bit more proactive about this entire process. But if people come to you, as I said earlier, in their mid to late 40s, are they looking to you to be a kind of guru, somebody who will simply say, oh, boom, and everything is going to be all right. Right, right. You're going to lead me to the promised land. Exactly. I'm like a, a counselor. <laughs> uh, if you come to me, uh, I don't have a magic wand. I can. I have some things that I can work with. I'm confined by what you have, what your income is, the assets that you have on the table already. If we go to a marriage counselor and the marriage is all messed up, they can't wave a mar magic wand and make the marriage okay. Um, you have to work in within the confines of what you have and there are certain possibilities. Honestly, there may be something that you're, that you're more inclined to do. Um, you may have to retire a little later than you had anticipated. Your lifestyle may be compromised a little bit. You may have been used to living at $80,000 a year. In retirement, you may be down to $50,000 a year. That's just reality. But at least you're kind of putting a stake in the ground and dealing with the actual facts versus some sort of fantasy land. Is the investment environment for the average family different today than it was a year ago? How has your business changed? How has your business model, if you will, changed as a result of the, of the economic and financial meltdown we've seen over the course of the past year? Uh, for, fortunately, my business model hasn't had to change because we focus on financial planning, which is an overall assessment. You know, we figure out where the client is, you know, financially, what resources do they have, you know, what's the, the expectation for um, increases in income, employability, not just having a job, but if you lose this job, how likely it is that you can replace it at the same kind of income because people don't really have a grasp of that as well. You know, what, what not only are your expenses right now, but what commitments do you have? You know, if you've said you plan to, to fund three kids through college, it's gonna cost X amount of dollars to do that. So understanding the current obligations as well as future commitments and, and putting a dollar value on all of those things to come to some realization of this is what it's gonna cost to make that happen. You know, and if that ends up being a, uh, one and a half times the, the income you currently have, 
something has to change. You know, some adjustment has to be made. So um, our model hasn't changed, but I think the, what this environment has done for a lot of people is make them at least a little bit more receptive to facing the facts of what that reality is. Maybe the house I'm living in is a little too expensive. How Maybe important are Lata and Antoine to the person who comes to you and says, look, my cousin told me that if I could get into real estate right now because the values of real estate are so low, if I can get into real estate right now, my cousin is a, is a part-time realtor, and he told me that I could make a whole lot of money right now, that's the only kind of investment I need to be involved in. How important is A, financial literacy, literacy and B, the kind of advice you can get from professionals? Well, knowledge is power. And if you're going to jump into the real estate market with little to no education on what it takes to be an investor, how to value a property, how to purchase it, what the purchasing options are, you have a whole different issue. And a lot of people jumped into the real estate market as owner occupants and as investors without fully understanding the market. As Lanta was saying, with obligations and commitments, they got these big mortgages and didn't factor in the, well, I'm paying $500 a month towards my parents' uh, nursing care or something like that. That means that you need a mortgage is $500 less in some cases, and that wasn't factored in. You had people saying, well, um, I can just go ahead and buy this property because it's going to um, accumulate equity, and then the bottom fell out of the market, and people are literally three, dollars $400,000 upside down or underwater in their properties with no way out. It is knowledge is power, and it's just, it, again, it goes back to the microwave society. We want it now without spending the time to get educated on how to purchase a property, numerous nonprofits that are out there to help people buy properties, numerous real estate investment organizations where you can reach out and touch somebody. I'm not talking about the middle of the night infomercials, but where you can actually go out and talk to somebody who is a real estate investor, ride along with them to see how they value a property, understand what it takes to own a property and what your margins need to be on every property that you own if it's an investment property. Lanta, what do you say to people who say, look, I Investment counselors are for people who have a great deal of disposable income. I don't have a lot of disposable income. Is there anything you can do for me? Absolutely. There are a number of advisors who offer hourly consultation with clients so that you have an opportunity to um, go through what specific information you need. They can help you sort through all of your financial information, your financial life, and figure out um, what adjustments you might need to make. So those opportunities are available. People just need to seek them out. So if I happen, Antoine, to be a conspicuous consumer, if I feel that in order for me to maintain my image, I have to have a new car every three years, if I feel that I have to buy completely new wardrobes every summer, and I come to you and say, but I have no disposable cash, what would you tell me? Well, you're going to have to make a lifestyle adjustment or there's <laughs> not something, there's really not much we can do for you. Um, I really don't have a lot of tolerance for, for people that, that come and they want to live X, Y, and Z lifestyle, but they have A, B, and C money. So if that's the case, um, you have to make some tough decisions. You can continue with this lifestyle. You're probably not going to be able to retire. You're going to be a slave to this lifestyle for the rest of your life. Or you can kind of take a step back and decide what, what, what is the necessity and what is the luxury and decide that you're going to treat yourself every once in a while, but you're going to have to make some overall lifestyle choices. What if they say to you, okay, I'm prepared to make lifestyle choices, but w after what I've seen happen on the market during the course of the last 18 months, I'm scared. And that is a legitimate concern. Um, what I would offer, again, a lot of this is based on education. If you take a look back at the markets over longer periods of time, you're not supposed to be in the stock market if you only have a 12 or 18 month time horizon anyway. So if you look back and say, well, I'm 45, I'm 50 years old, I plan on trying to retire around age 65, we well, have a pretty significant time period where you're going to have an opportunity to go through the ups and downs of the market. Overall, over long periods of time, it's very rare that you would be at a loss um, in, the, in that regard. The other thing that you need to concern yourself with, I have a lot of clients because of this crisis that have decided they're going to hide out in cash uh, in this kind of environment. Well, because they've been trying to stimulate the economy, the interest rates are, have decreased significantly. So you have very low rates, you're not earning um, hardly anything at all on your cash, uh, but we are going to start to see some inflation creep into the market over the next couple of years. 
If you're in cash earning less than 1% and inflation is at 2%, well, by definition, you're just continually losing your purchasing power over time. So it's imperative that you have a plan, you have a longer term horizon, and that you have made some decisions where you're going to be able to outpace inflation over the long term to have a, a good investment plan in place. So the mattress is not the place to put it right mm -hmm. now. How important do you feel it is for people who would like to try to build some financial cushion for their future to take your kind of service seriously? Liter uh, financial literacy. You have to take it seriously because again knowledge is power and you have to pass it on to generations to come and you have to start somewhere. The one thing that this economic crisis did was it flushed people out of the closet. People were forced to come out and seek help. We have been raised never to talk about money. We have been raised not to ask for help and this economy and this environment forced people out and that's one of the benefits of it is that people did come forward and start asking questions. Some people waited a little too long because they were in denial but at least people did come out and they started asking questions and seeking assistance. The only thing your mattress is really good for is sleeping. For your financial future, you need to talk to people like this. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Thank you all for joining us. You can find more information on these organizations and organizations on how to face the mortgage crisis at our website at whut.org. As always, stay well. Good night.